All right, we're in week three. So I have got to look at a lot of your um, check-in survey results. And I'm going to finish looking at the rest of them today. And I think the most uh, common concern is the um, sequencing of codes, knowing what code comes first, second, third, etc. cetera. Um, knowing what particular term to look up in the index is another area. So Hopefully we can I uh, can create a review based on what input you have for the surveys. Well, it seems like everybody's doing pretty good so far. So another thing I do want to add is what we're doing is we're we're getting really deep into coding. We're getting into the um, the fine details and all the nitty gritty. And when you get on the job, it's not necessarily going to be this stressful. You'll probably have a specialty that you would code for, um, like maybe for a digestive practice, um, maybe for cancer treatment. Um, a lot of the ICD-10 codes are, are for common ailments that you might have on an encounter form, like a heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, which we're talking about diabetes today. So it is overwhelming what we start. We get very detailed into all of this information. So I don't want that to intimidate anybody and think, you know, I'm not going to be good at this on the job because um, that's not going to be the case. It's just we are going over literally everything in this ICD-10 book. So it's okay to make mistakes when you're um, practicing and doing the reviews. Um, we we want to be able to have that atmosphere where we can make mistakes because that's how we learn from them. Uh, all right, so getting back into module one here. I did update the PowerPoint, so I'm going into the week three folder. And on our lesson plan, so we have three different chapters that we're covering, but these chapters are not bad at all. Pretty straightforward co uh, coding. Really isn't a whole lot of guidelines for these um, three body systems, three areas. So um, there are some videos to check out some extra resources. And I've got two files here. I'm going to download the PowerPoint. So I just finished this up yesterday. So if you haven't, if you accessed it before, it's got some changes in it. And before we get started, we get our code books out, our ICD-10 books. And let's start with some review. So first thing we want to take a look at is for Martin, he has severe sepsis. So we're going back to our guidelines for our infectious and parasitic diseases. Martin was admitted to the hospital for severe sepsis. And notice this doesn't say septic shock, just severe sepsis due to anaerobic streptococci. So we know the pathogen that's responsible for the sepsis. It's the streptococci. And Martin developed acute respiratory failure. He had lung failure. And our guidelines for coding sepsis and severe sepsis tell us what we need to do for this scenario. So sepsis uh, diagnosis assign the appropriate code for the underlying systemic infection and the organism responsible, which was the streptococci. And if it's not identified, you can use code A41.9, sepsis unspecified organism. That's the first code. A second code will come from category R65.2, severe sepsis. And uh, a I'm sorry, an associated organ dysfunction is also documented. So there's three codes total. And I want you to take a moment to code this, to find the three codes. So we're going to need to start in our index. I'm just going to make some notes while I'm talking. Um, what was that? OK, so go to your index for diseases and injury. And you're going to look up sepsis due to strepto. I can't spell that. Streptococci. Streptococci. Okay. So we need to look up in our index the sepsis that ties into the organism, the infectious agent. 
And then we need a second code from category R65.2. And then we need to code for uh, the, or, the respiratory failure. So index failure respiratory. But also when you get to category R65.2, look at the notes for the code because it will probably list the code for respiratory failure or kidney failure that you would need to complete this scenario. All right, so we're gonna take about two or three minutes. I'm gonna give you some time. Try not to peek ahead on the next slide because uh, it has all the codes. But we're gonna code this case study for Martin and follow our guidelines. And actually, in the index, when you look under sepsis, I don't think it shows up under do to, but it is listed for streptococcus. So to start, we'll get our code for the sepsis from streptococcus. And then our guidelines is going to tell us to go directly to go to category R65.2. When we go to R65.2, we need to make sure we look at all the category notes for the code. And this is acute respiratory failure. So it will take another minute or so. All right, I'm going to go ahead and look at his codes here. So three, he's got A40.9 for his streptococcal sepsis. 
R65.20 for sepsis severe without septic shock. And then J96.00 is the acute respiratory failure. So we had to use the index to look up the streptococcal sepsis. When you go to category R65.2, look at the code first, uh, code also notes for this category. So there's several. The code first notes will say code first, the underlying infection. And then at the bottom, we see sepsis, not NOS, not otherwise specified, just unspecified sepsis. So these are all suggestions. Of course, our sepsis was identified as streptococcal. And the code also notes, use additional code to identify specific acute organ dysfunction, such as acute kidney failure, acute respiratory failure, critical illness, myopathy, et cetera, et cetera. So we did have respiratory failure, and it gives us J96.0. So even if we're not familiar with the guidelines, the book is still going to guide us to correctly code. All right, so J96.0, I'm going to turn to that code, and it is J96.00, acute respiratory failure, unspecified whether with hypoxia or hypercapnia, and that's true. If it's not mentioned in our scenario, we wouldn't include it. So these three codes cover his case. So this is, like I, I said earlier, coders are researchers. That's really one of our primary goals. And this type of information helps to fill in, you know, what caused the particular infection of sepsis and what specific organ failure followed it. So it's for tracking data. That's basically why we have these guidelines. They're issued by CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and also the National Center of Health Statistics. So um, how do we get data to study it? How do we advance in medicine? This all ties together. All right, now we get a little bit of an easier one. I want you to get to your neoplasm table in your ICD-10 book. So, for, and for those of you at home, go ahead and turn to the neoplasm table. And we're looking at Susan. She has a carcinoma in situ of the vermilion border of her lower lip. Very specific. And a carcinoma in situ means it looks like it has the capacity to have malignant changes. And the situ means it's situated. It's situated at its primary site right now, but it does have the ability to turn malignant or um, metastasize. So we have six columns in the neoplasm table. Malignant primary, malignant secondary, carcinoma in situ, benign, and unspecified, unspecified being the code of last resort. So when we go to our neoplasm table, we're first going to find lip and then vermilion border and then lower. I'm going to give you a moment here to find that in your table. So you're first going to start with lip. Then you're going to find vermilion border and then lower. So I'll give us a minute before we look at the table diagram. So on my slide here, I have it outlined, what you're going to find in your index. So we see on our six columns, carcinoma in situ is highlighted, since that's what our neoplasm is. We see lip up here at the top, starting a category, and headings indented under lip, 
several. We want to find down here where it says vermilion border, and then it's further specified as the lower lip, which the upper and lower looks like they both have the same code. So it, the neoplasm table tells us D00.01. So now what we have to do is look up our code in the tabular and whoops, make sure there's not any code also notes, code before notes. We need to check our excludes and includes notes. Make sure we are in the right category. And this is indeed the correct code. So D00.01, if I go back up to D00.0 and look at the notes, there's a note that says use additional code to identify exposure to environmental tobacco smoke or tobacco dependence, tobacco use, use and dependence being different things, which we're going to talk about today, or uh, history of tobacco dependence. We don't have any of that information to add that, so our code is just going to be D00.01. Okay, we're looking at another case study with the tricky HIV guidelines. Jesse Bergman tested HIV positive eight years ago. She is admitted with meningitis due to herpes zoster zoster arising from complications of HIV. So this is an HIV related illness. Our guidelines tell us for selection and sequencing of HIV codes, patients admitted for HIV related condition, the principal diagnosis is B20 and followed by additional diagnosis codes for the related condition. And part B, patients with HIV disease admitted for unrelated conditions, uh, like an um, unrelated injury, traumatic injury, the, uh, that would be the principal diagnosis. If it's an HIV patient breaks their ankle, and that's what they're coming in for treatment, the uh, fracture for the ankle is the first code, but an HIV code is always going to be on the record. Whether it's first or second or last, it's always going to be assigned because it's a systemic disease that will affect medical decision making. All right, with that being said, we have meningitis due to herpes zosters. Herpes zosters were arising from complications of HIV. So take a moment, go to your index of diseases and injury, and I've got on my screen here a, a shot what it's going to look like. So you're going to find meningitis and then in or due to herpes zoster. So we go to our index of diseases and injuries. We're going to look at meningitis in or due to herpes zoster. And when we get to that area in the index, it gives us code B00. I'm sorry, B02.1. So there's an entry for herpes simplex virus and then herpes zoster. So our specific code is B02.1. So we find that, we then go to the tabular list, right to the code, B02.1, and read any category notes. So we go back to B02, there is an includes notes. 
So I'll give you a moment to get to B02 in the book if needed. Includes notes, shingles, and zona. So there's not any excludes or code also notes or code before notes. B02.1 is zoster meningitis. But this patient particularly has complications. It's from the HIV. So B20 is going to be added in there, and it's going to be the first code. So in this scenario, B20 is the first code, the principal diagnosis, because it is responsible for the manifestation of the meningitis. Uh, oftentimes, meningitis is a sign of the infection, even if people don't know they have it yet. That sometimes is an indication that something's off. And the immune system is compromised, so it makes it a lot easier to get meningitis and pneumonias. But those are our two codes for this scenario. And the only reason we know this is because there's a guideline that tells us what we're going to code first and why. All right, we have one more review. This one was really hard, <laughs> but that's why I thought this, this is a good one to take a look at. So Emily has American histoplasmosis with pericarditis. She was diagnosed with AIDS one year ago. Okay, so she has AIDS. We know we're going to get B20. If it's documented as AIDS, it means it's symptomatic because there is a code for being asymptomatic. So she has American histoplasmosis with pericarditis. So let's get back to our index. And we're going to look at histoplasmosis. And then for American, it says C, capsulati. And then Capsulati has an entry for B39.4. So just take a moment to locate this in your index. So that gives us code B39.4 when we get to look that up. So after you look that up in the index, go ahead and turn to the code in the tabular. I do want you to start in the index first. So we want to get in the habit of being able to locate what we're looking for. All right, when we go to B39.4, there is a code first note and a use additional code note for manifestations. So this is important because when I went to the index for pericarditis, I did not find what I needed to show that it was from the histoplasmosis. The pericarditis is a manifestation of that. I didn't find it in the index. I did find it, however, in the notes for the code category. So when we go to B39, we have notes to code first, associated AIDS, so B20, and then use additional code for associated manifestations, such as endocarditis, meningitis, pericarditis, which is inflammation surrounding the heart, and retinitis. Well, in our code scenario, we have American histoplasmosis with pericarditis, and this is an AIDS patient. 
So this category is giving us the information we need to code. We know we need to code first the AIDS. We know we need an additional code for the pericarditis. So B39.4, when we look at that specific code, which is, I think, on the next page of the ICD-10 book, it's American histoplasmosis, also known as capsulati. So B39.4. And B20, we know that one's going to be first. When we go to I32, so now I'll take a moment and turn to I32. So I32, that's all there is to this code category, pericarditis and disease classified elsewhere. So that's indicating it's from a disease, it's secondary to a disease like the histoplasmosis. And we have a note there, code first, underlying disease, which we did. We have B20 and the histoplasmosis code. So our scenario is completed with these three codes, B20, B39.4 and I32. And the only way we're going to get this is through practice. <laughs> it's going to take a while before we get real comfortable with these guidelines. And that's what we do. We're, we're here to practice and make mistakes. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Now we did our review. So we're covering chapters six, seven, and eight. So these are blood and immune system disorders, mental health, and the endocrine system. And like I said, it's pretty straightforward. So we're starting with the review of the blood. So it is a type of connective tissue. It's made up of red, white, and platelet cells. The formation of blood begins in a bone marrow, believe it or not. And the process of formation is called hematopoiesis. Uh, different types of blood types. Do you all know your blood type? I think I know mine. Um, well, that's important to know if you're getting a transfusion. <laughs> you had surgery a month ago. Did they verify your blood type? O positive, yep. And O negative is the, gen uh, was it the universal donor, the O negative. Uh, but your blood type is from what specific antigens are found on your blood cells. So there's antigen A, antigen B, antigen AB, and antigen O, type O. Uh, the Rh factor is an antigen on blood cells that produce uh, immunosystem immuno responses to individuals without it. And this becomes tricky um, in cases of birth with a... Um, mother that's Rh negative and a fetus that's Rh positive. So medical intervention is needed before the mother's uh, immune system attacks the baby, basically. So transfusion, blood must be compatible with the type and Rh factor or consequences could be serious. And I'm gonna skip over some of the basic info. So blood tests are commonly performed to diagnose illness illnesses. <laughs> blood tests are captured with the procedure code, the actual test itself, when um, you, you do the um, IV or, or whatever and, and draw the vial. All of these tests are found in our procedure code book, and they are performed in support or to find diagnoses. So I see blood, urea, nitrogen, um, tests for kidney function. Glucose, um, you know, diabetes is very prominent, systemic illness also. So blood conditions can result from many problems. Anemia, there are several different types of anemia. Uh, this is a lack of red blood cells or, uh, you know, transportation of these blood cells aren't very efficient. So a person with anemia can feel tired a lot because they're not getting that nice oxygenated blood to keep them going. Clotting disorders like hemophilia. So these are individuals where they get a, just a tiny cut and that could be fatal because the bleeding will not stop. It won't clot. Thrombocytopenia, low platelets. 
And then hematologic malignancies or leukemia. Other conditions, sarcoidosis is where cells clump together and become a granuloma or a, a tumor shape throughout certain organs in the body. Wiscott Aldrich syndrome is a genetic mutation that happens a lot to children and increases, causes white blood cells to malfunction, so therefore the immune system is weakened and lowered. And all right, that's pretty good summary. That was the blood system. Okay, now we're going to code it. So uh, let's code it. Neonate female, born vaginally without incident. A uh, 29 year old mother had a blood transfusion from a postpartum hemorrhage from her first pregnancy. The mother's serum was found to have antibodies to the father's platelets. And these antibodies had been incited by the previous pregnancy infusion. They crossed the placenta to cause alloimmune thrombocytopenia. What a great medical term. In addition, she had red cell incompatibility. An exchange transfusion was performed to compensate for hemolysis or the breakdown of the blood. So, with this big long note, we have alloimmune thrombocytopenia. So we go to back to our index of diseases and injury, and we're going to look up the key term thrombocytopenia and try to find our code under this heading. So I'm going to give you a moment. We're going to look up thrombocytopenia in the in index. Oh, Chris is RH negative and both her kids are positive. Wow. Thanks for sharing. So we're looking up thrombocytopenia as you read down the indented list there's two choices that may pop out one being for congenital and one being neonatal and due to exchange of maternal thrombocytopenia so these two terms can cause a little bit of confusion. Congenital means present at birth. However, this condition was, however, the patient is a neonate. And the documentation says this condition is due to the extent exchange with her mother. So between these two codes, P61.0 is our correct code. So the physician states the baby contracted this condition as a result of the previous transfusion. This is not inherited because it's not a result of genetics. So that's another good way to remember congenital has the G-E-N for genetics. Uh, it's a result of circumstances. In addition, the treatment worked, so the baby no longer has the blood problem meaning the thrombocytopenia was temporary or transit. So this gives us one code, P61.0. Not too bad. Like I said, these codes don't have uh, tricky guidelines. <laughs> it's a pretty straightforward coding. All right, our next let's code it is even better <laughs> to look up. It's not a bad one at all. Uh, so instead of reading it all, we have a diagnosis of Cooley's anemia. So we have an eponym. 
with our disease. All right, so we're going to go to our index and look up anemia and then try to find underneath of that coolies. So Cooley's anemia, you turn to the alphabetic index and we first find anemia. There is a long list of different types of anemia, but we should find an entry for Cooley's, also known as erythroblastic D56.1. So once we get our code, we have to go back to our tabular. So we'll look up D56.1. It does have several excludes one notes of conditions that could not be coded at the same time as Cooley's anemia. But there's no other code or any other information that we need to add. So we just have one code for this guy, D56.1. Beta thalassemia, also known as Cooley's anemia, rhymed. All right, our last let's code it for the blood system. We have Marlena, she has sarcoidosis of the lymph nodes. So we go back to our index. We look up sarcoidosis and then lymph nodes. So we're finding, trying to find the code for sarcoidosis of the lymph nodes. Let's see, I think I need to add my code there. <laughs> All right, so we should get code D86.1, sarcoidosis of the lymph nodes. So now we'll just go back to our tabular. We'll look up D86.1. And this category does not, for the code D86, there's not any um, notations. There's not any excludes, includes notes. Code also use code additional, code before. So our final code is D86.1. 
Not too bad. All right, we're moving right along into the endocrine system, which includes the top offender, diabetes. So the endocrine system is responsible for secreting hormones that controls our metabolic activity. These hormones are secreted in the blood. They're basically like keys that turns on uh, different functions of the glands. And there's several glands throughout the body. So the thyroid gland can be a big offender for hypo or hyperthyroidism. <laughs> Diabetes, this has the abbreviation DM for diabetes mellitus. Chronic disease, it's systemic. Um, and you know, being a teacher and learning about all of the manifestations of this really freaks me out. <laughs> maybe I think, maybe I should, I have two diabetic parents, maybe I should watch, <laughs> do something about, you know, but not ending up diabetic, because it's, it's scary to think about, it's the stuff that happens to your feet, to your eyes, you can have kidney failure. Uh, type two diabetes is our most common. So um, there's four different types. Approximately 16 million people have diabetes. So there's type one, which is a very severe type. Um, this is known as juvenile diabetes, type one. The body does not produce any insulin whatsoever. Type two manifests over time. It's much more common not necessarily as severe, um, but there's um, consequences. <laughs> uh, secondary di diabetes mellitus can come about from different health conditions. Cystic fibrosis is an example, um, and that's a systemic disease affecting children. Cushing syndrome, that's another example. So it can affect glandular function. So secondary diabetes is brought about from a outside illness or ailment. And then gestational diabetes, which is diabetes that occurs during pregnancy. So again, type one known as juvenile diabetes, mo this mostly occurs in childhood. Very rarely an adult go is, is a, a type one diabetic just becomes one. Type two has a gradual onset. It can develop at any age. It can also be known as non-insulin dependent diabetes. So due to its involvement with the blood system and muscle and fat tissue, several manifestations can occur. So ophthalmic, um, glycoma and retinopathy, um, deterioration of the vision is a side effect. Neurological manifestations, what's called peripheral neur neuropathy. So like the hands and especially the feet are at risk. A lot of times diabetics, if they get a cut on their foot, it takes a long time to heal. Sometimes uh, diabetic patients have to have some amputations. Renal manifestations or kidney failure and other circulatory system manifestations. So it's a lot more serious than we realize. It's not something to be taken lightly. Long-term use of insulin can be added to a medical record. It's done with code Z79.4. So um, that definitely affects uh, medical decision-making for a patient if they are a long-term user of insulin. That has to be taken into account for any treatment or prescriptions that are prescribed or given for a patient. Uh, let's see, hyper and hypoglycemia, high or low levels of blood sugar, are different from diabetes. So these instances can still occur, and they have their own specific codes. Uh, let's see, functional activities. We kind of talked about this with neoplasms last week. A lot of times neoplasms can cause um, side effects for a gland to function properly, um, like maybe a neoplasm affecting the pituitary gland. Uh, for women, neoplasms affecting the reproductive organs can um, cause changes in hormones production. So this is sometimes captured, this uh, glandular function side effect. Insulin pumps can have two different codes if they malfunction or break down, and then it's uh, further defined by an underdose or overdose of the insulin pump. That's a mechanical device. Diabetes encephitis is a water metabolism disorder. 
and it's coated with E2 3.2. Weight factors can be um, considered for uh, medical decision making. So it's not uncommon to code or have a code for body mass index that might be included on a record. Um, a lot of times, every, I mean, I think every time now when a patient goes to see a provider, they do vitals and they do an updated check on the BMI. So if a patient is getting pretty in a risky area, a high BMI, there might be some interventions that take place. And then hypo and hyperthyroidism both can have pretty extreme effects. So hypo means the thyroid is, is producing lower than normal. So this can cause weight gain or fatigue. Hyper means it's excessive. So it can cause weight loss, rapid heart rate. All right, that's our summary for the endocrine system. Now let's code it. <laughs> All right, so Andrew is a type 1 insulin-dependent diabetic. He has no other complications, so we just need a code for his type 1 insulin dependence. Of these. All right, let's go to our index, and we're going to look up diabetes. Diabetes is a huge category. So uh, we start, when we look this up in the index, we have diabetes, diabetic mellitus, sugar, E11.9. And just to save us a little bit of time, that E11.9 is for type 2 diabetes. So if you were to start with that one and look it up in the tabular, you would realize, okay, that's not what I need. I have a type 1 diabetic patient. So underneath of the first uh, entry for diabetes, we see with and amyotrophy, arthropathy, et cetera, et cetera. Then it goes down to due to. And then we see gestational. We want to find where it says type 1 under diabetes in our index. So we're looking for diabetes and then type 1. All right. So we do get the code E10.9. So we have to finish our step by looking this code up, E10.9. This is a big category for this one. So a lot of these codes, like if you go back to where E10 begins, <coughs> type 1 diabetes, and start following all these codes, E10.1 is with ketoacidosis, E10.2 is with kidney complications, E10.3 and E10.32 have its own seventh characters pertaining to this code. But all we have to go by is he's type 1 diabetic. So the E10.9 is the correct code because he doesn't have any other complications or manifestations. All right. 
So guideline spotlight. These are in the guidelines of your book. Um, this is a particular one I wanted to highlight. The type of diabetes, if it's not documented in the medical record, what type it is, if it's type 1, etc., you're going to default to E11 point whatever um, applicable fourth character, type 2 diabetes. So if the patient's record, Janet Thompson is diabetic, she has diabetes. We don't know what type, if it's type 1, type 2, we're going to default to the type 2 category. So that is an actual guideline. And I had this one pop up on my CPC test, so that's why I always remember that. All right, let's see Chet. Let's code it. Chet is diagnosed with diabetes insipidus. So let's go back to our index. Wait a minute, where'd I go? All right, so we're going to go back to our index, diabetes, and then insepidus. Spell that very good. Insepidus. I didn't spell it right. Might help if I spell it right. In sip. Like we're sipping water. In sip. It is. Okay. Now, spelling can make a difference when you're trying to find something in a big category. So when we look up in our index for diabetes and insipidus, it gives us code E23.2. So then we just turn to the tabular and verify if there's anything else needed for this code. So E23.2 just has an excludes one note for nephrogenic diabetic, diabetes insipidus. So nephrogenic meaning it's from the kidneys, produced by the kidneys. So our final code is E23.2. Uh, I think I'm going to skip this one just for Tommy's sake because we got one more chapter. Uh, so we're going to skip the hereditary erythropoietic porphyria. Love those medical terms. And we're going to look at this one. This was a little more complicated situation. Um, let's see. Amelia came with her husband Ralph to see her doctor. She complains about fatigue and problems with remembering. Her husband complained that she's been irritable. He's found Amelia wandering the neighborhood several times over the last few weeks. She admitted to being on a new diet. After a complete physical, the doctor confirmed her diagnosis is dementia caused by B12 deficiency. So a vitamin B12 deficiency is very crucial to our meta, uh, our metabolism, keeping everything balanced. So we have dementia caused by B12 deficiency. Let's go back to our index. So our index. Dementia in or due to the 
vitamin B12 deficiency. I want to take a moment. I want you to stay on the index for just a second when you find this. So I want to point something out. There's two codes for this. <laughs> so once you find this in your index, Notice the entry where it says B, vitamin B12 deficiency. There are two codes, E53.8, and then in brackets, F02.80. So this is telling the coder two codes are involved and in what order they would be. The E53.8, since it's listed first, is the first one. So we need to make note of that. We have two codes. That makes it a little easier for us. So now we write those down. Just make a note, E53.8 and F02.80, because now we need to go to our tabular. So let's start with E53.8. Turn to our tabular. So this vitamin B12 deficiency is the culprit, is the cause for the dementia. So that makes sense why it's listed first. E53.8 uh, includes biotin deficiency, cyanocobalamin deficiency, folate deficiency. It excludes folate deficiency anemia and vitamin B12 deficiency anemia. So it is specified for B12. So that is going to be our first code. And our index let us know that, that we would have two codes. So E53.8 is the first one. Now let's go. We have our second one, F02.80. Take a moment to turn to F02 in your tabular. So at F02, we do have a code first notation of the physiological condition, such as Alzheimer's, very common to have manifestation of dementia. But ours was B12, so we do have that listed in the first. It's going to be our first, so we are following this notation. And when we go to F02.81, because this code is, I think, two different columns. Uh, we see there's a note here at the bottom of F0281 in red. Use additional code to identify wandering if applicable. And if we go back to our scenario, she was wandering. So we're actually going to have three codes. And the tabular is directing us to find these, to code these. So the important thing is to take your time when you're coding. Be sure to read all of the notes. And be sure to go back to where that code category begins and read any notations for there. So we have, oh, for, I'm going to have a skip turn into to this particular code. But C91.83 does have notes to also code underlying disorder, such as Alzheimer's, autism, et cetera. But our scenario here, we have these three codes. And the book pretty much guided us to all of them. The index showed we had the two codes at the beginning, E53.8 and F02. And then the notation on the F02 category 
advised us if there's wandering, use an additional code. So if for research purposes, we want to see how prevalent these conditions are, if there's a uh, cause and effect. All right, our last chapter is coding mental and behavioral disorders. This is the F category. So pretty straightforward coding. Um, we're going to be looking at um, things like uh, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, also drug use and alcohol abuse and cigarette smoking comes from um, this category. So I'm going to skip through some of these. Get down to our worksheet, Tom. Um, there is a difference between documentation of abuse or dependence. Dependence is the body is physically has to rely on the drug to function normally. Like an alcoholic, you get to a point where you can't just quit and one day you, you have to wean off because the body is depending on it, it needs it. Abuse is just an, is considered excessive use not necessarily depending on it. Use is defined as consumption without clinical manifestations. Uh, schizophrenia codes is five different types. And bipolar disorder is also known as a mood disorder for um, exhibiting acute mood swings from going from euphoria to depression in the span of um, a day or even a few hours. So there's two types of bipolar disorder, type 1 and type 2. There is a good video in our folder for this week about OCD um, and, and decreasing the stigma of mental illness. Phobias, irrational fear of an object, activity, or situation. What is it? Arachnophobia? Is that the fear of spiders? Yeah. Uh, some of the phobias can be quite amusing. Uh, somatoform disorders is a belief that one is suffering from an illness that is not present. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, broad spectrum of what can be covered under this condition. Um, surviving a natural disaster or a um, an excruciating event can cause PTSD. Um, it's not necessarily something that's tied to like going to war. <laughs> um, lots of different interactions and owners can have this effect. And notice on post-traumatic stress disorder, when you're trying to find something like this in the index, it's this one was tricky for me to find. It's under disorder. So you want to think of uh, what is the specific ailment? What is the post-traumatic stress? It is a disorder because I would be looking under PTSD, post-traumatic. I'm like, why can't I find it? It's under disorder. Uh, I did think I read something interesting this week about vaping. There's a lot of mysterious illnesses now being tied to the use of a, a vapor. You guys heard of vaping or, or, or know what it is? It's an e-cigarette. So. Um, they're, we're just unsure what's causing these, if it's from the device, if it's from the specific substance. And right now, there's no real way to code that or track it. Um, there's a code for being dependent on nicotine with other devices, but um, those vapes don't always use nicotine substances. Um, I think they use like scented, scented stuff, maybe um, flavored, flavored. Um, but there is some pretty bad side effects that are coming along with those, and we don't know enough yet. This is going to be a problem that we have to address. And this specific code uh, would come from the F category, dependence on nicotine from other devices. So I just thought that was interesting development. And this is why the encoding is so important, is because we study why these things happen, what are the connections. All right, our let's code it. Let's see, I might skip these because they're easy and we got to get to our worksheet. Um, so for Herbert, he was diagnosed with alcohol dependence with alcohol mood disorder. 
So we would look up dependence in the index. We're not going to do that now, but we would look up dependence and find our alcohol and mood disorder code from there. And then our other patient was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. So we would look in the index for schizophrenia and then paranoid. So pretty straightforward codes. These sections, not too bad. All right, I'll close the PowerPoint. And we're going to take some time to do our worksheet review. So for those of you at home, um, you can access the actual, I've got the, um, the questions and answers here, but that's also in our folder, the chapter 678 self-check, if you want to do it um, through Blackboard. But these are the questions we're going to spend time working on. And the answer guide starts on the last part of the pages and explains any particular guidelines. So, uh, oh, Sean's heard of vapes exploding. Yes, I have heard of that. The the e-cigarette device, there's, um, that, that can be a risk. There's people that have been killed by that. It lo a piece lodged in somebody's throat from the um, vape machine. So yes, there's a, <laughs> how would we code that? There's probably some external cost codes we'd have to add with that to explain that, but uh, all right, so for class, I'm going to stop the recording.